Do you want me to share the the talk or to wait until? Uh... Uh, I think um, uh, maybe just later is fine. I just uh, yeah whatever. maybe uh, have we tested whether I guess the yes. share screen should work. Yes, it right? looks okay. good. Let's see. So I know uh, people will join. Uh, we can at least go ahead and uh, get started with the introductions. So uh, I'm Milin Tambe. I'm Milin Tambe, director of the Center for uh, Research on Computation and Society, CRCS. And uh, uh, so I'm, I wanted to just uh, kick off this meeting by introducing a few key people. Uh, the first is uh, the two postdoctoral researchers at uh, Circus that are putting this uh, meeting together, uh, Arpita Biswas and Harman Saxonu. And we also wanted to welcome our new uh, program administrator and, and epidemiologist, uh, Haila Bernstein. So I wanted uh, Haila to maybe say uh, a minute of introduction on and then following that, we will hand this over to Arpita to introduce our speaker for today. Great, thank you. Thank you, Miland. Um, hi, my name is Hyla Bernstein and I'm um, a program planner and evaluator uh, coming from a local public health um, perspective, but really excited to be uh, working with folks at Circus and the, the greater community to, to um, take on projects that involve AI for conservation and public health. Okay, with this, uh, handing this over to you, Arpita. Um, thank you. Thank you, Melind. Uh, thank you, Hila, for the introduction. Um, so uh, I'll directly uh, switch to uh, today's agenda. And uh, today we have, we, are, we have the pleasure to have uh, Omar Rheingold. So Omar Rengold is the Rajiv Mothwani Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University. And he's also the director of the Simons Collaboration on the Theory of Algorithmic Fairness. Uh, his past positions include uh, Samsung Research America, the Wiseman Institute of Science, Microsoft Research Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, um, and many more. His research is in the foundations of computer science and most notably in computational complexity, cryptography, and societal impact of computation. He's an ACM fellow and a Simons investigator. Among his distinctions are the 2005 Grace Moray Hopper Award and the 2009 Gordel Prize. So with that, I will hand it over to Omar. Thank you, Arpita. Uh... I told the organizers that I have visited Circus about uh, a little bit more than 15 years ago. So it's a pleasure uh, to visit again. It uh, has been uh, uh, developing and, and doing so well. Um, so in the two, two weeks be between the time I agreed to give this talk and, uh, and now I managed to change what I was thinking about talking about. I thought I'll give you a talk, which is perhaps a little bit of a general survey about algorithmic fairness and, um, and some uh, misconceptions about it. Um, but uh, I decided instead to talk about 
a very recent work, which is joined uh, with Cynthia Dwork, who is also a circus member at Harvard. Michael Kim, who uh, was my PhD student now, a postdoc at, uh, at Berkeley, Guy Rothblum and Gal Yona from, uh, uh, from Weizmann. And uh, uh, I would suggest paying attention to Michael and Gal. They will, uh, there's a lot of great things in their future. Um, and what I want to talk about is uh, some try, an attempt to understand uh, the meaning of individual probabilities uh, from a computational perspective. It's kind of uh, perhaps some steps towards that. And let me ask you to ask me questions uh, whenever you feel like it. You don't need to wait to, till the end. And this way I'll be able to distinguish that from the other time that I speak to myself, I guess. Uh, so feel free to make some noise so I know that I'm not, uh, not alone. Okay, so, um, so risk scores. Uh, whether we want it or not, uh, every day uh, we are measured by a collection of algorithms. Um, and they're trying to estimate some probabilities that relate to us. Perhaps the probability that we will click on a news article or an ad that happens all the time. The probability uh, of a heart attack in 10 years, perhaps if we are looking for a life insurance. And the probability that we will repay a loan if we are applying for a loan. And all of these decisions are based on a lot of uh, personal information and uh, the stakes are very high. Uh, life-changing decisions are made based on all of these probabilities. So where does these, where do these uh, uh, risk scores come from? Um, move. Okay, good. Uh, so where do they come from? Uh, well, as we all know, uh, they come from uh, machine learning, right? Machine learning is the one that gives us all these beautiful algorithms for predicting all of these uh, probabilities. And as we know, uh, machine learning has been doing great things for, uh, for all of us in, in various ways, giving us a lot of benefits. So perhaps uh, this uh, stork is also laying uh, some golden eggs, but yes, there's many things bad in this, in this example, both uh, from a literate literature point of view, but also uh, because we all know uh, that uh, machine learning is much more um, a meat grinder than a stork. So how does it work? What is the pipeline of creating these predictors? Uh, we start with some data that we collected. In this talk, I won't talk about uh, uh, how this data is collected, if animals were harmed in this process, what's the quality of the data? Uh, let's uh, leave it for now as a given. We then feed the, the data we collect into these machine learning algorithms. And the machine learning algorithms now will try to fit a model of all the data that they see. They will try to fit it, but not overfit it. And, uh, and in that process, they're trying to minimize some loss function or optimize some objective. And after processing and, and working hard, uh, they will produce a model. And this model is what uh, they learned. So, and this model we can then take and apply to individual instances, to the personal data, for example, the medical data of individuals to predict the probability of a heart attack in 10 years. This model can be used again and again. So we train a model once and then we apply it again and again for different individuals. So let me kind of take this picture and turn it, I give a few notations. This, is, this single slide will give you most of the notation we need for this uh, talk. 
In fact, as we'll try to argue, perhaps it gives you more notation that you actually need for the talk, but uh, we'll see that. So we have some population, perhaps all the, all the individuals in a particular country or uh, something like that, population uh, chi. And we have individuals that are sampled from this population and they are represented by an arbitrary set of features. Uh, but the case that will be interesting for us and it is uh, growingly the, the interesting case is when this set of features completely identify an, an individual. Perhaps we have some genetic uh, information or even much less than that. Everybody that works on privacy knows how little it takes to completely identify individuals. And then we have for any individual, we have some outcome. So if we're predicting the probability of a heart attack, eventually this individual will either have a heart attack in 10 years or not. Sorry for the morbid uh, example. Um, and uh, for now, for this talk, we'll, uh, uh, we'll consider binary outcomes, yes or no, but we can consider any other uh, outcome as well. And, um, and what I'm going to talk about can, can be extended to that. And now uh, we, what we want to predict is these individual probabilities. So the probability that this particular individual will see this particular outcome, perhaps a positive outcome. Um, and so the probability of individual X having a heart attack in, in 10 years. Now, if, you, if this bothered you, then that's okay. That's what we're, we're here uh, to examine. What is this probability at all? And we'll talk about it in the next slide. But then given that setup, we have a learning algorithm that gets as input some sample, some historic data, which is pairs of individuals and whether this uh, event happened to them or not. And it is a, it's, it's producing an output, which is the predictor. And this predictor will give for every individual some probability uh, of, uh, of this outcome happening. So P tilde of X is the algorithm's estimate of this P star of X. This is what it should be. So yeah, so not too many uh, uh, notations. Perhaps we should just remember that stars uh, kind of relates to nature, either probabilities or outcomes, and tilde will relate to the algorithm, the predictor. But here is this, the issue. So the issue is that kind of, how do I understand what these individual probabilities mean? So I'm a single person and whether I'll have a heart attack in 10 years or, in, or not, is, a, is an event that is going to happen once, we cannot repeat it. Uh, and it's not clear, I mean, what's the probability over? Uh, so either I'll get it or not, perhaps instead of a probability, I can imagine that I have kind of a, a bit uh, hidden in my forehead that tells you if, if I get it or not. So of course, we didn't ask this question uh, first. It's a question that has been, uh, uh, so what are those P stars X? This is a question that has been debated uh, for decades in particular in statistics. There's a lot of beautiful research about it. Uh, and we are not planning on resolving it. So at the end of this talk, it's not that uh, we'll have a complete agreement and resolve all the questions that are left by statistics. But I want to say that anybody that does anything in machine learning or uh, AGI should care about this question. We are producing again and again, all of these uh, predictors. We're trying to estimate all of these probabilities. And if we don't know what they mean, how can we, I mean, how can we justify what we do? And even more than that, how can we justify using them um, uh, for very uh, high stake uh, uh, applications. Um, 
So one way of kind of trying to understand it, and this is a way that perhaps computer scientists uh, would, would think about it, is kind of imagining that there is some randomness in the environment. Um, and, and so the probability is not over uh, me, but over the behavior of the environment. So what does this supposed to capture? Perhaps it captures some limited information. Perhaps the probability of a heart attack would depend on whether um, a, a particular uh, plant fires a, a, an individual. This is not part of the data of the algorithm. We can't expect the algorithm to know that or to know all the environmental aspects of, uh, of uh, that can happen or not. And so there is some limited information that, uh, that is captured by this idea that the environment has some randomness. And what I want to advocate here is that it's not enough to think about limited information, but we also need to think about limited bounded computational resources. And we need to understand it in order to understand or to think or to argue or about, uh, about what these individual probabilities are. So the scale of this issue, the scale of, of algorithmic decision-making really calls for revisiting the question of individual probabilities from a computational perspective. Even if you don't buy anything I say from this point on, I hope you would uh, buy that, that uh, we need to understand it from a computational perspective. So perhaps you won't like how I try to understand it, but uh, I hope that the goal is, uh, is understood. And I think this goal should be uh, a joint with anybody who, who works in this area. So what's the plan for this talk? And I'll start by talking about, so trying to understand this uh, computational aspect, we'll use ideas from this area of computational indistinguishability. So I'll give a very short uh, detour into that. And then I'll introduce this notion, this new notion that, uh, that we introduce, and this is outcome indistinguishability. We'll discuss a, a variety of variants of outcome indistinguishability, in particular, a hierarchy of these definitions. And then we discuss what can and cannot be obtained. Is this outcome indistinguishability a goal that is obtainable or not? The answer will be pretty interesting. Uh, in this process, we will employ ideas that come from, uh, recent ideas that come from the algorithmic fairness uh, literature and the notion of multi-calibration. So this will be another extremely short one slide uh, detour. And then we'll try to ask ourselves, what did we learn in this process? Um, so that's, that's the plan. So let's start talking about uh, computational indistinguishability. And I'd like to start it with uh, a metaphor or an idea that uh, Avi Vigderson uh, often use exactly for this purpose for talking about computational indistinguishability. So I graciously stole this example. And, uh, and this is about perhaps what a process that's the easiest for us to think of as a probabilistic uh, event, which is the flipping of a coin. So if uh, somebody flips a coin, then, and you need to bet uh, about something that depends on this, the outcome of the coin, you would probably assume that the coin is uh, as probability half to, to come up as heads and half to come up with tails, especially if you saw the same person flipping many coins and that's essentially what happened overall. So, uh, what, so the idea is that you would assume that there is no difference between this specific coin flip and, um, and any other. And on average, these uh, coin flips are, have probability half of being heads. Um, so that's, uh, so, and that's, I mean, it sounds like it's completely something we cannot argue with. But I want to argue uh, that even in this case, uh, randomness is in the eye of the beholder. So it depends on the perspective. So if we imagine the same coin flip, but now we imagine that we have a variety of sensors 
uh, aimed at, at the place where this uh, uh, coin is flipped. And they are connected to an extremely powerful computer in real time. Then perhaps uh, throughout the process of the coin being flipped, let's say uh, a, a, f a few uh, parts of a second into it into the flip perhaps we can say with pro with completely with complete certainty or almost complete certainty if the coin is going to come up as heads or not so here too whether this is a, whether randomness exists or not or what is the, the probability even in this very stylized example uh, that really captures what we think about randomness, uh, probabilities are, are really depend, depending on uh, your perspective. And they must include some understanding of computational resources. Because if I only have the sensors and I, have, I don't have a computer that can calculate it quickly enough or powerful enough, then I cannot, it won't help me. So it's the inf information and the computational power. So with that, let me, uh, uh, right. So I see uh, that there are, there's some activity on the chat. Uh, so if uh, one of the organizers monitor it and see some question to me, then feel free to, uh, to convey them, but also feel free just to unmute yourself and, uh, and, uh, and just ask your questions. So let, let's discuss computation and distinguishability a little bit further. This is a short uh, detour. And um, so, so computation and distinguishability came up in cryptography. It's a very central notion in cryptography and in complexity theory, but in fact, it has applications in all of computer science. Uh, whether you know it or not, often some of the objects people use are pseudo-random. Uh, and it deals kind of very, very uh, high level. It deals with distributions that look like they are uniform, look like they are uniformly distributed, although they are not. And what does it mean that they look like they are uniform? It means that they are computationally indistinguishable from the uniform distribution. So a computational observer, a computational distinguisher cannot tell if a particular element was sampled from one distribution or the other. So what's the, the metaphor for us to understand it? The analog, the analog, I mean, a very natural analog is that of a wine tasting. So if we have uh, two wines kind of behind the curtain, one is an expensive bottle, one is a relatively cheap uh, bottle that uh, conveniently is called the decoy. Um, and now we get a glass that is uh, from one of these wines, but we don't know from which, and we need to tell which one. At times, it could be the case that we uh, just cannot tell. So perhaps if we cannot tell with probability more than half, uh, so for example, I'm not necessarily uh, extremely successful in this game, then it means that we cannot distinguish the two wines. We can think instead of the Pepsi versus Coke challenge. And if I cannot distinguish between the expensive wine and the cheap wine, then for all uh, uh, purposes, uh, the cheap wine is as good or it's the same for me as the expensive wine and it just, uh, uh, it's a better investment uh, for me. There are interesting psychology experiments about it. So perhaps the cheap wine in the expensive bottle is the best, uh, is the best uh, option for me. I'll enjoy it because I think that it's expensive. Um, but okay, so that's the analog, but let's uh, go to the, to the real thing. So here we have two distributions behind the curtain. If we're talking about pseudo-randomness then one of these distribution, D1 is going to be the uniform distribution. And the other one is a different distribution. We think this will be the pseudo-random distribution. And we have some computer, some algorithm taken from some class of algorithms. We have, and this algorithm is, is shown a sample from one of these distributions. 
and it needs to tell me if it's a, 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 if it's zero or one, if it thinks that it comes from D zero or from D one. If the probability that this algorithm is correct is, is uh, roughly one half, it cannot really distinguish with probability better than one, I mean, be correct with probability better than one half, distinguishing a non, with non-negligible probability, then D zero is a pseudo-random distribution because it is indistinguishable from the uniform distribution. And perhaps like, just like the one, it's much less expensive for various reasons. This notion is also uh, relevant for other uh, distributions, arbitrary pair of distributions, D0 and D1, and we'll just say that they are computationally indistinguishable. We don't need that one of these distribution is uniform. Okay, so that's all I want to say about computational indistinguishability. And now let's try to see why is it relevant to what we're discussing, if at all. So what's the role of computation, right? I've been saying again and again that if we want to understand individual probabilities, we must understand some, something about computations, but okay, uh, why? And so if the goal is to approximate some P star, given a, a, a sample of individuals data and the corresponding outcomes, then the one, the first thing we should no, is that there is no way of achieving individual accuracy. We cannot be correct uh, for every individual or mostly correct for every individual, uh, unless we make some very strong assumptions that about the learnability of this uh, P star. And perhaps these, in some cases, these assumptions are unreasonable. Perhaps they are reasonable for most of the population, but perhaps they're not reasonable for some uh, parts of the population. So this could be the source of uh, discrimination. Discrimination and fairness are not the main issue that I'm discussing, so I'm kind of just saying it in passing, but uh, that's kind of a concern. In fact, any level of accuracy depends on the computational resources that you have. So let's look at the case where these are the individuals and these are, these are the P stars values. So in fact, there is no randomness in this story. Every individual is either going to see one with, pro, with certainty or see zero with certainty. So the outcomes are really kind of, as I said, are written on your forehead. You just don't see it. See it. Um, but let's assume in addition that the distribution of zeros and ones is computationally indistinguishable. So we said what is computational indistinguishability. Now we have two distribution, the distribution on zeros and the distribution on ones, or alternatively the distribution of zeros and the uniform distribution, either of that would, uh, would be the same. So if these two distributions are identical, then um, we can't really see all these zeros and ones. We cannot, although perhaps there is the information to that we, we could have used. We have enough information to separate the zeros and ones. It could be the case. Uh, perhaps we, we just cannot compute it. So from our perspective, perhaps the right way of thinking about it is that all probabilities are halves. Uh, so just given a, a predictor P tilde, which is always half. And in fact, what I want to say is that this is going to be irrefutable based on the outcomes. So we cannot distinguish the real nature that uh, works according to the picture on the left and an hypothesized nature that operates in a different way. For every individual with probability half, it gives it a positive uh, outcome. And for probability half, it gives it a negative outcome. So this is not how nature works in our story, but we cannot distinguish in some sense, in the sense that we cannot distinguish if the outcomes, if they are based on that or the other, it's, it's not refutable. So I'm going to define it more generally now, but I hope this example uh, kind of demonstrates it to some extent. Again, let me re reiterate that questions are are, are okay. 
Okay, outcome indistinguishability. So let's take this example and try to generalize it and, and try to define it more generally. And so a predictor P tilde gives us a generative model for outcomes. The model is that for every individual X, the outcome is selected with probability P tilde of X. This is, uh, this is what we kind of imagine when we think about these uh, individual probabilities. So this is what a predictor tells us. It gives us a model. And let, uh, let us define, so this is really the last notation, O tilde of X to be the outcome sampled in this way. As I said, we have the stars, this is the real nature, the tildes are this hypothesized nature, the, what happens based on the predictor. Outcome uh, indistinguishability in its weakest fo uh, form, I'll, I'll, I'll explain, is about the computational indistinguishability of these two probabilities. On one end, the probability that of pairs X and O tilde of X. And on the other end, it's the probability of pairs X and O star of X. So for every distinguisher from a class A, it gets a sample from one of these distributions. It doesn't know which. The distribution over X is always the same, but of course the difference is uh, in the distribution over the O. And it needs to say whether it believes that it's from the left or from the right. And uh, this, is, this P tilde is outcome indistinguishable if uh, these two distributions are the same. Now, this doesn't mean that P tilde looks like P star. It's not that they are indistinguishable. For example, perhaps P star is always zeros and ones. There is no randomness but the outcomes are going to be the same. So you cannot uh, refute this notion that uh, the world operates based on P tilde. And I'll, I'll be a bit more exact uh, soon. So let's start with a few comments about this definition and then we'll talk about variants of these definitions. And then we'll try to ask ourselves, okay, it's a nice definition or not, but can we obtain it? I mean, uh, is it an obtainable uh, definition? So, so a few comments. Uh, one interesting thing is that we compare this X O tilde of X with X O star of X. And this makes no reference to the real individual probabilities, P star X. It just makes references to the outcomes. So we don't need for this model to believe that there are these uh, individual probabilities. Uh, we just uh, uh, need to believe that there are outcomes. So perhaps every individual will either have a heart attack in 10 years or not. Uh, we don't, the definition makes no uh, reference to this P star X, which is, exactly what we are kind of unsure about, right? We're not sure about uh, what are, what do they mean? We have a notion uh, that doesn't need to refer to it and we never see these P stars. We only see the outcomes. So that's one comment. Omar, um, mm -hmm. there's a question in, yes. Uh, Daniel, do you want to read it loud or I can read it for you? Oh, I could, I could read it out. Uh, let me start my... Yeah, so um, I have a question, Omar, about the, um, about the statistical limitations. So I think in one of your slides, you said you can estimate, like if you have a, like a lot of cameras, for example, um, like me, which translates, I think, to having like a lot of computational power. Um, and you talked about a number of examples. So I'm wondering, like, so it seems that uh, the amount of computational power you, you need is lower bounded by the, the, the statistical power you have, right? Um, and so are there cases where you might have, let's say, I don't know, infinite computational powers, but limited examples, and still do better than the finite uh, case of like having both computational and statistical limited resources? Um, 
Right. So, so I, I, let me try to answer. And if I'm, I got that question wrong, then, then please correct me. So in a sense, there are two ingredients here. There is the computational power and the information. Um, so in the example that I had, the, the cameras or the sensors give me all the information, perhaps what's the speed and what's the direction of the coin, etc. And the, the computational power is some of the computer. And the question you're asking, uh, uh, great question is if there is a trade-off between these two. Uh, in fact, there is a trade-off. Uh, I can find examples where the data is, uh, uh, I mean, the data could be very, so in, in terms of our, what, what we are looking at, so going back to what we really care about, the information that we really care about is the attributes. So how meaningful are the attributes that we gather for individuals? It could be that uh, without, uh, that the information is, uh, the attributes are so great that one of them exactly tells us what we are trying to predict. First, one of the attributes is exactly this probability. So with great attributes, uh, the computational uh, problem becomes uh, trivial. And there are sets of attributes uh, where, uh, where it, the, the, computational, the computational power determines uh, the, the issue. Finally, there are cases when we just don't have enough information. So for example, if the only information we have uh, is uh, if a particular individual is from group S or group T, perhaps S is a protected group, then all we can do is produce this extremely uh, biased uh, predictor uh, that kind of tells me what's the expectation over S or the expectation over T. So yeah, there is an interplay between these two and it's, a, it's very important to study it. I want to make a comment at the end about this interplay, but it's a very good point. Thank you. Good. Thank you for the question. Until now, I wasn't sure <laughs> if I have an audience. <laughs> so uh, good. So, so this is exactly actually the point I was about to say. The definitions are parameterized by the family A of distinguishers, which is the computational resources and the representation of individuals, and in, which is the information. So when we say that outcome indistinguishability is not refutable uh, it, based on our computational resources and information, this is what we mean. And with a different set of uh, computational resources, more computational resources or better information, we may be able to distinguish. What is the interpretation? So we may still be unhappy about P tilde. For example, we believe that there is no randomness in, in what's going to happen. We believe that if we had all the information in the world, we could predict it with probability, with complete certainty. So, and P tilde doesn't give us this complete certainty. So we may be unhappy with P tilde, but we cannot empirically refute it. So just given the samples that we see, we cannot distinguish between the case that this is really the, uh, what the P tilde is really governing the world. So it is a model of the world that we cannot refute. Again, so the small letters are always uh, given a particular set of information and the computational resources. And this reminds a little bit the scientific method. P tilde is kind of an hypothesis that we cannot refute at the moment. Let me talk a little bit about variants of this. So one important variant is, uh, is this notion of, uh, so we talked about indistinguishability of a single sample. You see a single individual and either you see the outcome, uh, the real outcome O star, or you see the hypothesized outcome O tilde. But in reality, whenever we have P tilde, we'll see lots of individuals. So we want uh, indistinguishability to hold in this case for multiple samples. Um, and that would be the definition. And for some interesting, for many of the interesting uh, families of distinguishers that we care about, there is a standard uh, cryptographic argument known as the hybrid argument that will show that this definition is equivalent up to parameters to the definition that only looks at a single sample, which is one kind of motivation for us to look at a single sample. 
And then perhaps a more interesting uh, distinction between the variants is the hierarchy of uh, OI. That's how we call oblivious uh, in this, uh, outcome indistinguishability, OI, uh, based on uh, access to P tilde. So this uh, example above, the vanilla one, which is not completely not interesting, we, consider, we call it no access OI. So we only see individuals and outcomes, we don't see P tilde. Hey, oh, sorry. The other one uh, should be sample excess OI, uh, which compares now triplets. You see X, P tilde and O tilde, or X, P tilde and O star. Um, so, so here we see also the, the predictor tells us you know, the, for this individual, the probability is uh, one third. And then we see the outcome. And we cannot tell if the outcome was sampled based on this probability or not. So this is definitely something that makes sense. And I'll motivate all of these in an example uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, Oracle access to OI goes a step further. It assumes that no, not only you see P tilde of X for all the X's that you encounter in your sample, but you see it also, uh, you, can, you can ask for it for any other ones. So you have a black box access to P tilde. Imagine P tilde in a box and you can feed it uh, um, inputs and see outputs. So uh, uh, yeah, so for example, in the patient's example, we can ask, okay, what would you predict if this patient had a lower level of cholesterol? Would it change your, your uh, uh, prediction? Um, and then uh, we have code excess OI, which say, get, takes a step further and say, you know, show me just the code. This P tilde is a predictor, you created it. So there is some code for P tilde. When I want to distinguish if it's explanation of reality or not, I want to see it. Perhaps seeing it will help me refute it. And we'll uh, take a, a, now a story, an example to explain these uh, different uh, variants, no access, sample access, oracle access or code access. So this is a, a tale of three medical boards. Uh, we have this company, it's uh, it's. Um, it's the best software company in the world. How do I know that it's the best software company? Because the mission statement of this company is to keep being the best company in the world. And then we are supposed, I mean, it's, it's good to believe what companies say about themselves. So it's, this is the best software company. And it came up with a predictor. It has a software that predicts perhaps uh, some probability of complications in a particular procedure for individuals or, or something else. And now there is a medical board that needs to decide whether to approve some usage of this P tilde. Uh, it's not necessarily that it will approve it uh, uh, for making decisions, but perhaps it will approve it to informing decisions, perhaps as an aid to a, to a physician as an additional test. But if it's, if it's garbage, we don't want to approve it. It can lead to mistakes and to unfairness. So let's see uh, how three different boards are going to, uh, to handle it. The first board says, you know, here is this predictor. Let's try to audit it over time. So we see one patient, we see the prediction this audit, this uh, software says, and we see the outcome. And we see a new patient, a new prediction, a new outcome, and so on and so forth. And now we want to somehow um, test to audit whether we are happy, whether it looks like it's operating well. And one point to note is that uh, kind of this kind of statistical tests, uh, for example, for this sequence, I mean, are well known uh, in statistics and usually they are defined in a way such that uh, something that's really generated from reality would always pass the statistical tests. So in particular, if we are in a world, not in the real world, but in a different world, 
where the outcomes are sampled based on P tilde, so in the X, P tilde X, and O tilde X, then the statistical test, the standard statistical test or audit will pass the test. This means that if P tilde is OI with respect to the appropriate uh, set of distinguishers, then the real uh, examples will also pass X P tilde of X, but O star of X because they are indistinguishable. So they are indistinguishable to these uh, tests. So in particular, it means that OI is a notion that is stronger uh, than, uh, than a lot of what we kind of are used to think when we think about uh, tests. So the American uh, or this, this medical board that takes this uh, approach that we, we mentioned will be happy uh, because P tilde is uh, oblivious uh, uh, outcome distinguishable and therefore uh, it will pass the test of the board, any test of the board. So that's one board, but um, right. So the board will just ask if, if these triplets are, uh, look like uh, they come from where the O's come from P tilde. The second board is a little bit more demanding. It will say, you know, I don't want to see your prediction only on patients that arrive. I want to be able to, to ask your uh, predictor additional questions on different non-patients. So for example, I have a patient and I want to ask whether a, a higher cholesterol would have, or lower cholesterol would have changed your prediction. And, and based on that, I will decide uh, uh, how, uh, what's the test I'm running. So perhaps I will only run the test on patients that are where this uh, particular attribute is important, where the prediction changes. And so I want to use more information. I want to still emphasize that at the end, perhaps P tilde gives you garbage on, on non-patients. In fact, most things that we create are fail with respect to uh, adversarial examples, but that's not what we're testing. Eventually you'll be tested based on the real examples. So you, need, you still need to distinguish between this kind of triplets and this kind of triplets, but in distinguishing, in deciding what test you're doing, you can imagine that the test now depends on some additional queries. And this third board will, will be even more demanding. You say, you know, you want us to use your software, give us, give us the code of this software and we will use it in some ways uh, uh, in order to get even stronger family of distinguishers. And the question that we'll ask is, how do these uh, compare to each other? So what I want to claim or show in this example is that the three variants, uh, in fact, there is a fourth one, right? The easiest one, but the three stronger variants are very uh, natural in, in this uh, context of auditing. Okay, so before we go uh, further, let's recap what we've seen so far. Uh, we, we've seen that risk score predictors are used uh, in a wide scale of algorithmic decision-making. There is no consensus uh, about what they mean, but they have dramatic impact on individuals, both in terms of accuracy and in terms of fairness, uh, which I don't discuss so much uh, here. But in, even in terms of accuracy, if I get a, different, a, a wrong medical prediction, I may choose a wrong intervention. In the case of fairness, perhaps a particular population is going to see worse outcomes than a protected pro a group than, than some other groups. Or it takes a computational perspective and implies predictors that are irrefutable from real life observations, given particular uh, information and, re and computational resources. And so this is a strong notion. And the next question is, is it attainable? And also, if it is attainable, is it good news or bad news? Are we happy that it is attainable or not? And the answer, I don't know. We'll see. So the answer is yes. It is good news and it is bad news. Okay. So the results as a high level, um, 
first sample access OI is feasible. And so the first two levels of this hierarchy are, are feasible in a strong way. And this, is, this relates on this equivalence to multi-calibration, which is a recent notion from algorithmic fairness literature. And I'll talk about it briefly in the next slide. On the other hand, when we go to the next two levels, Oracle access OI and code access OI, they're only weakly feasible. Uh, and the way they are still weakly feasible is based on extensions of the algorithms we have for multi-calibration. Uh, but they're only feasible when the error is large. So distinguishers have errors. Uh, I mean, every distinguisher can, can have some probability better than half uh, to, uh, to predict the right thing. The question is how much better than half? So it's half plus epsilon. What is this epsilon? So if epsilon is 0 0.01, perhaps we can do that. But perhaps if it is a, a very small error, perhaps that depends on the, uh, on the dimension of, of our problem, we cannot. And finally, Oracle access OI and code access OI are not strongly feasible. So not only our algorithm fails, all algorithm, all efficient algorithms will fail and we can show it based on various uh, results from complexity theory, from fine grain complexity, or even based on weaker assumptions like PPP is different than P-space. This is a sentence only meant for the complexity theorists in the crowd or that are going to watch this video. Don't worry about it if not. And I want, the interesting thing is that it is a rather unique case in, uh, pseudo, in the pseudo randomness uh, literature say rather unique because I just cannot think of another example. If I could, then I just say unique. Um, okay, so let me give you in one slide. Uh, it's not important from what we're showing, but this talk cannot be given without telling you about something about multi-calibration or multi-accuracy, which is where we uh, started this work from. This is our inspiration. So again, think about this uh, individual coming to the, to the physician and, uh, uh, and asking what's, kind of, what's uh, the probability that uh, perhaps I'll develop uh, type two diabetes in the next 10 years. The physician says 0 0.4. So you ask uh, why? Well, you know, there is this study and uh, for people that have profiles similar to yours, and for these people, you have, uh, they have on average 0 0.4 probability. So this now it's probability over a random person from a population. This kind of probability is easy to, uh, to measure and to understand. You go home and you, you search the internet and you find a different study that shows that for people with your profile, but with a different set of attributes that still apply to you, they have probability 0 0.7. So what's, what's the truth? Is it 0 0.4 or 0 0.7? And even if this other study just said 0 0.4, what does it mean? Does it confirm what the physician told you? Or perhaps now you have two different risk factors and your probability is higher. And perhaps there is another study that doesn't capture you, but capture some other people in this group that you're uh, associated with which is higher. So is it good news for you? Perhaps your probability is lower now because perhaps these, these are the individuals that create this high probability. So what's the point? The point is that probabilities over groups are easy to define and measure if the group is large. But the question of which group you're associated with has a huge impact. And in particular, it can, it can and it does I mean, it's not a theoretic uh, concern. And it does imply discrimination. If you're viewed uh, as a member of group uh, X and not group Y, then uh, perhaps you see different outcomes. So in the work that we had with uh, Heberett Johnson, Kim and Rosblum from uh, 2018, we defined this notion of multi-calibration and this is one when you're consistent with a huge basis of statistical evidence, not only with a few uh, constant number of tests, but a huge number. And, uh, um, 
and, and for all of these, perhaps exponential number of sets, you're correct. So no matter which set you review that, at least on average on this set, you get the right, uh, the right uh, probability. So this, at least there is no uh, kind of systemic, observable systemic discrimination. This is in reaction to the weakness of group fairness definitions. It's a partial answer to this conflict between calibration and balance which some of you might heard of. Uh, it applies in a wide range of settings, for example, for rankings, for uh, confidence intervals, uh, for uh, um, non-supervised learning. And it comes with efficient algorithms and surprisingly it has been uh, implemented very quickly for theory work, it's very quick which I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. We theoreticians really like to have our time to brew with our results uh, instead of uh, implementing them immediately. But it actually emphasizes how important it is to, to do research in these areas and, and to get good results quickly. Okay, so I have five minutes, I think. Uh, so let me very, very briefly tell you a little bit more about the results in two slides, but uh, perhaps a couple of minutes, and then I will, uh, I will, uh, so this will be a little bit quick, but then I'll, I'll talk about what do we learn, which I think is more important. So again, sample OI is feasible just because there is some equivalence between multi-calibration and sample OI, which is interesting in itself because a limited family of tests, which are calibration tests, parse, all the tests that we could care about, all the distinguishers that we could care about. So there exists P tilde that is, that is outcome indistinguishable, it's OI, and is almost as efficient as the as members of the distinguishers it's compete with, competing with. So specifically, if we if we have that these are circuits of size S, then our p tilde can be computed in size s over epsilon squared. Epsilon squared is this error parameter of the distinguishers that I mentioned. And the interesting thing is that this is independent of the complexity of O star. O star can be arbitrarily difficult, but still we can find something that kind of explains it and is, its complexity depends on the distinguishers, not on the, uh, not on the, on reality. Furthermore, you can learn this P tilde in time that depends on the learnability of A, on the weak learnability of A. So again, it's independent of the learnability of O star. And this is the typical case in pseudorandomness or in distinguishability. The complexity that we expect is the complexity of the distinguishers, not the complexity of reality. So even if reality is very, nature is very complicated, you can explain it in a simple way, as long as your tests are not too complicated. And a closer look on the results, uh, Oracle access OI and access OI are weakly feasible through an extension of the previous algorithms. Now the dependence on the error parameter is poor. So instead of having S times one over epsilon squared, it will be S to the power of one over epsilon squared. And uh, in fact, we can show that this is necessary using uh, various uh, complexity theoretic uh, approaches. And this is unique. Usually uh, it doesn't, we don't care about the complexity of what we create, but we only care about our, the complexity of our tests. So let me kind of conclude, uh, sorry for rushing the last couple of slides, but perhaps it's not as important. What I do want to, to end up with, with some thoughts about what we've shown. So understanding individual probabilities uh, in the eye of the beholder, uh, kind of as something that depends on who's, who's uh, making these assertions requires a computational perspective. Outcome indistinguishability is one way of formalizing this understanding, relates to the scientific method. So this is one way of understanding individual probabilities. Perhaps they are not really what governing reality, but it is an explanation that is indistinguishable, that is not refutable. It's an hypothesis that we cannot refute. Uh, OI gives some strong guarantees in terms of accuracy and even in terms of uh, preventing some types of discrimination. And this is obtainable. 
So the bad news about it is that individual predictions may be way off. So if reality is complicated, we cannot approximate it. We can come up with P tilde, but it won't approximate reality. It may be way off, but we will not be able to observe it. So perhaps we're making decisions based on predictors that are really inaccurate for many individuals. The good news is that if we have access to predictors, and so if we have this black box access to the predictors, we can increase the power of auditing. So this is a scientific way to uh, support this notion that if you are creating some governing board, uh, you should insist to have auditing not only based on samples, but also on the ability to query this uh, um, to this predictor. And this is uh, something that came up even now in California in a particular proposition, but I don't have time to, to discuss it. And, uh, and I think we just with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Omar, for the wonderful talk. Um, I think, um, I mean, if, if participants are okay to stay back for a few more minutes to ask questions, we can do that. I think Omar is here for some more time. And um, I'll quickly announce something before we start the question answer uh, session is that uh, next week also we have uh, another talk by Heather Lynch and she's going to talk about uh, AI and uh, conservation. So um, please feel free to uh, attend. I mean, it, it will start at the same time, 11 a.m. Uh, next Monday. And um, with that, let's, uh, let's start the question answer session for this talk. Um, I'll start by um, reading out one question by Daniel. Uh, and uh, I think he left because he has another class. I'll just read it out. So he asks that to use the hybrid argument, um, don't we have to assume an advantage between each pair of examples of tildas and stars? And how do we compute such an advantage? And what we need to, I mean, that's quite, I'm happy to kind of, uh, it's a technical uh, issue. I'm happy to discuss offline. I don't know if it's worth everybody's time, but it mainly need, it's a question about the distinguishers. So for example, many of the distinguishers we care about in, uh, in this area in machine learning are non-uniform and hybrid arguments are exactly what uh, works very easily with non-uniform distinguishers because you can plug in, if you have a distinguisher for the two uh, kind of sequences, you can plug in particular values and you're left with the distinguisher just for uh, two, uh, just for a single sample. So if you have a distinguisher that's too good for one, you get a distinguisher for the other. The distinguishing probability does deteriorate with the number of samples, but perhaps, but that's, that's kind of the hybrid argument. Yeah, thank you. Sure. <clears throat> um, let's see if we have more questions. Um, yeah, I so, mean, yeah, meanwhile, uh, I... Yeah, sorry, Melinda, yes. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. I just wanted to say I may need to leave. I sent a message to Omer, but uh, thank you. Thank you so much for really an exciting presentation. And I'll come back to you with the question I have, but unfortunately, I have to go. Appreciate you. your joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, I have a question regarding uh, something that you mentioned about auditing. So I was uh, wondering, um, I mean, shouldn't, uh, again, and this relates to fairness. So most of these predictors also have like, uh, they, they might have taken some information to, to build up the predictor. So they might have considered certain features. So does that affect, should that affect uh, while auditing, should there be something like what features have been used and um, would yeah, that, that be a concern or it's more like a black box? That's, that's excellent. Uh, that's an excellent point. So one additional thing I can ask the predictor uh, um, as an audit is to see the data you have uh, trained on. This, for example, can let me know that you really applied this particular learning algorithm 
of course, these learning algorithms also have some randomness. So perhaps you played, and we've seen examples where with a particular set of data, if you use different, different randomness, you can reach different uh, conclusions. So perhaps you also commit to the randomness before the experiments. So this is this is about uh, reproducing your experiments, and this is this is a great point, and this could increase uh, the ability to audit, or at least to audit for particular violations. Uh, but here, I want to essentially audit the, the the learning algorithm to see. So perhaps I I trust that you apply it honestly, but I, I don't necessarily trust that this algorithm is is any good. Uh, but it's a great question. This could be, it's kind of orthogonal a little bit to what we, uh, we, we're discussing. We, here we, even if you have just this Oracle access, I don't know what samples you use, then, uh, then I can get some additional power, which we found a little bit surprising. Uh, it's, not, it's not a lot. <clears throat> perhaps asking for the code from uh, the software companies is perhaps too much, but even asking for the, the black box access could could lead for better auditing. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, I, I think with that, we will close uh, today's session.